I was listening to your chat with Tyler Hollett um, the other day. Oh, this, yeah. This Discord, and I thought he was a very bright fellow and had a lot of yeah. interesting things to say. And um, it made me think, I, and, and something that I've been thinking about for, for a while um, that I thought might be a topic that you guys could speak on quite well since you know Plato and Aristotle and the Greeks so well. And I, that is the idea of, of, of a soul. What is a soul? And how do, how do we how do we have a soul in, in, in this machine? And I, I've heard you talk and kind of redefine the notion of soul, John. And does that seem like a, a topic that might be of interest? In yeah, I am very interested in discussing that. I'm interested in discussing that in connection with uh, with gnosis and uh, dialectic. Very much, very much. Mm -hmm. So maybe I could start. Um, try, I've been talking with Chris about this and trying to, I guess, rec it's not right, rec recover. Maybe it's a combination. Uh, there's a word I want to use, and it, it doesn't exist in English. Uh, Kerry makes use of it in his book, Augustine's Invention of the Inner Self, uh, which, of course, is deeply relevant to what we're going to talk about. Um, now, the thing about that is Kerry takes great pains to say, that, well, he had, this is English. He wanted to use the Latin term inventio. Inventio. Uh, hmm. Yeah, and, the, re, and they, the publishers wouldn't let him because, well, they're publishers. Um, and the reason he wanted to, use, wanted to use the word inventio is that it hangs between our two words, invention and discovery. Uh, so this is where, for example... Um, you could get around a lot of thorny problems in math by saying math is neither in, invented nor discovered, but it is inventio. Uh, um, so I'm very interested then, if you'll allow me, uh, to reinventio. I want to reinventio um, mm -hmm. the soul, if that uh -huh. makes any sense. Sure. Um, and I want to try and do something sort of the opposite of Descartes. So for really important historical reasons, especially to try and form a, uh, an alliance between uh, the uh, uh, Catholic Church and the Neoplatonic magicians from the Renaissance, um, Descartes um, pretty much completely identified the soul with the self, and then he completely identified the self um, with the 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 center of subjectivity the the the, the place where mm. the mind touches itself in consciousness you know you're conscious by being conscious it's pure participation and as always with descartes when you're deconstructing descartes uh, you have to be really really respectful there's really important insights there that should not be abandoned but that confusion of uh, of uh, soul to self to subjective center is something I would like to try and uh, pull apart uh, while nevertheless keeping the connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, so also the soul is connected in some way with this notion of the divine double yes. um, or the sacred second self, well, I think, yes. as you, you've renamed that term. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's very much the case. I think there's something in here that the term uh, uh, soul is in, is aspirational. Um, but I would also like, like Moore does, uh, Christopher Moore does with Socratic self-knowledge and reconfigures, reinventio perhaps, um, the, uh, the, the self as something not possessed, but to which we have a perpetual aspirational relation to that. Um, your true self is is the um, the virtuous self that you're always aspiring to. Right. It's not, so the soul is not something we have. It's something we do. It's something we. It's an activity, and it's uh, something yeah. we aspire to become at the same time. Yeah. So um, what I think it's what the soul. Uh, this is an idea I'm playing with, serious play, and I've been playing with Christopher. He's one of my uh, best pers one of the best people to play with, as you can imagine. Um, this idea of I just have this image of you guys in the in the playground with marbles or something. yeah yeah great a, a great playmates <laughs> in a play date yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, although I may have lost a few of my marbles. Um, so, uh, good one. Yeah, I'm try and I'm trying to pick up on this notion that could resonate with Neoplatonic ideas of the one within us, um, which I can perhaps get to, and then Buddhist ideas about the no self and the true self, um, especially in the work of Nishitani. And, and so what I'm, what, I, what I'm sort of playing with is this idea that there's two ways in which we participate in a kind of transcendence. One is to be coupled to, um, well, let's put it this way. The emergence of mind is wedded to the emergence of world. And I don't mean the emergence of thought. I mean the, emer like the, way, uh, the way your mind has emerged developmentally. The emergence of mind and the emergence of the world as an increasingly complex, of, complex and dynamic set of intelligible affordances for affinity and aspiration. So... I'm going to use the, and what that does is that couples us to the inexhaustible, the moreness, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. But there's also that about us, um, which uh, I want to use a Buddhist term, which is our suchness. Um, it is, if this direction is the direction of participation, the moreness, the movement into moreness, this is the suchness is the is the direction towards individuation and the suchness is that about you that is resolutely um non-categorical that which that it's it's that which you love in a person which you love the their uniqueness and i want i don't like that term because it's so bound up with narcissism but when you pick up on the irreplaceable way in which that person can is and continues to be Hmm. Right, and you and you and you you get a sense of oh my gosh, right? That that's the suchness. Now the Buddhists claim that enlightenment is you get suchness for everything. It's so it's it's a way of um, tailoring your cognition um, to the being mode um, in everything, mm -hmm. and then. What I'm playing with is this idea that though the, individua the individuation, and this is right out of Tillich, and uh, Chris will tell you that, this individuation participation dialectic mm -hmm. between the moreness and the suchness, that activity is soul. Hmm. Between the moreness and the suchness. Yeah. Uh -huh. the so you mean between some kind of, let's say, ex excessive life and, 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 and just the simple existence? The way in which the inexhaustible overflows the world and the way in which the, um, the inexhaustible in you overflows any categories in which I try to particularize you. But nevertheless, I'm pointing something individuated and instantiated in you that is not individuated and instantiated in anything else. So this is like trying to pick mm -hmm. up on Indra's net and other ideas that um, you presence the moreness in your suchness and your suchness um, that about you, which is con uh, not just, not, I want to use a distinction of Proclus, not just a passive possibility, but the pure potentiality, the, poten the power, potency and act of being able to, right, assume, uh, uh, you know, a, a variety of identities, a variety of agent arena relationships, mm -hmm. and also assume this in your own idiosyncratic historical development. Yeah, and I think we talked about that with Zach that the soul is 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 not is not a singular thing. No, no, no. It's a, it's a multiplicity. It's of potentials rather than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah. So yeah, the soul is that within you. Uh, well, sorry, one pole of the soul sounds like Dr. Seuss. Sorry, one pole of the soul is that which in you has this inexhaustible capacity to do relevance realization and refit itself in an evolving fashion to the world. And then the participatory side, the resonant side, is the fact, and we experience it most in wonder and awe, that the, the world, right, it, um, the world discloses an inexhaustibleness that is always presencing through it. Hmm. And the soul is when those, so what I'm trying to do and you, Chris probably sees this. 
by you making use of Tillich's individuation participation and talking about this affining relationship, this mutual, it's not reflection, because the moreness comes into the suchness and then the suchness, right, um, adds to the moreness of the world, mm. <laughs> um, right? Um, it's great when, when I, you can get this, the, the handle of this vocabulary, it's very beautiful, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and, and so what, and, and of course this is deeply influenced with, with Whitehead, but I'll, I'll say one more thing and I'll let, let Chris talk, but what I'm trying to do, and again, I mean this respectfully, is I'm trying to give, I guess, a non-theistic or secularized uh, equivalent to what the soul's main function was, which was to worship. Hmm. The soul's main function was to worship. And Descartes, of course, left that transformative of finding to transcendence, hmm. right? He left that out when he collapsed um, the soul into the self and then the self into um, the unchanging um, center of subjectivity. Um, so I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to reformulate, reinventio soul in a way that exapts and reappropriates in a respectful manner the soul's main function, which is worship. Beautiful, yeah. And before Chris speaks, I wonder if the soul ever had a kind of fixed meaning, if all of these terms kind of, they have to be reinvented all the time, otherwise they, they become reified and they, ha they, have, they yeah. no longer have any meaning. Um, well, the problem is, things can become reified in this way, Andrew. They can be embedded in a mythos that stagnates and dies and yeah. that has not been replaced by any new emergent mythos that mm. discloses new logos, right? And in that sense, they're trapped within, and this is why Chris's metaphor of the dying star is so appropriate. They're trapped, they're, they're, they're sort of stuck on the uh, event horizon. If, I'll, if I turn mm. his dying star into a black hole. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and so thing, I think our notion of soul has been lost. Interestingly, in the performing arts, you know, there's a category of music, and you know this much better than my, I do, soul, in which there was an attempt to uh, reinventio soul as a particular way of, you know, connecting um, through and to music. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, you have to, you can distinguish between music that has a soul yeah. and music that ha doesn't have a soul. I mean, if you have a very fine, fine ear, and the music that has its soul, I think, is connected with that inexhaustibility. And mm -hmm. the music that doesn't have a soul is just a formulaic repetition of, uh, of something. You know, it might be very performative. It might be very salient, to use your term. Or, yep. you know? and, yeah. and that, and that, uh, that relationship uh, that I'm talking about of worship, that individuation, participation, tonos, a dynamic tension, creative tension, um, that's very aspirational. Mm. Uh, you are participating in the sacred second self while you're individuating the current self and re-individuating it and re-individuating it, tapping into its suchness until you actually come to appreciate and become um, or uh, asymptote towards the sacred second self. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Christopher, I, I want to hear from you. I want to hear you. Some what do I add to that? Riff, riff on, on some what of that stuff. What is there possibly to be added yeah. to that? Well, I, I guess, yeah unsurprisingly, what I say is just going to be a recapitulation of what John just said. Yeah. Chris, Chris, come on. But, 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 no, but that's access what I, what humility. I is, that's hang on. No, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't courting contradiction by saying that at okay. all. I'm just, I'm just trying to say that, that, uh, that was pretty comprehensive. I, I mean, okay, maybe I'll try Thank and you. put it, I'll try and put it, what you did, John, I'll try and maybe put it pithily. I, to me that if I had to distill it down, as a working definition, I would say that the soul, when I, what I understand soul to be is like the transitive property of the self that relates it to its own moreness. I, I always come back to thinking of soul as a, an, a, a, as a relational aspect, which helps to dislodge the notion that it's something fixed, an entity fixed within time and space, right? If it has, if its fundamental nature is as a relational nature, both expressive and impressive, then its function, in a very sort of Kierkegaardian way, its function is as a relation to be cultivated. It's as a relation, as the, of sort of a, it, it sort of like, it is the intermediary aspect in the orchestra of self that bridges between the, the, the suchness of its current composition 
to the moreness of the yet unheard melody. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's it's it, it's the tr the transitivity to me is the property of the soul that most eludes its definition, because and and it, that also explains its sort of multivocality and its equivocal definitions, right? Because it's if its nature is as a dynamical form of relation, then it's no wonder that we keep trying to foist definitions on it that it continually bucks and eludes. Mm. So, so I think that the 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 as. So, uh, yeah, when I think of the soul, the, the, the best place to start for me is to understand the soul as the expression of the existential and ontological relation that we have with the aspect of self that is to be disclosed with the moreness of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that. And, and that's perhaps why, well, I was thinking when, when, when John was, was mentioning the soul music and how soul music if music has soul, I mean, we're not talking about the particular genre of soul music, but just soulful music in general, it creates a kind of silence. It, it stops you in your track, but there is kind of a forward movement at the same time. You feel like you're moving and you're, you're still. Um, because it's always a double disclosure or it's a, it's a double. It's a, what I should say is like the soul is your power of faith. It's the power to, it's, it's the enacted power of wedding like the emergence of mind into the emergence of world, like I'm saying, uh, the suchness to the moreness. Um, and so I, 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 I guess what, what I mean to say is that it's always, it's always enacted in, in faith, the, but, but that, that faith that I'm trying to talk about, that, that ability uh, to continually re-realize um re religio mm -hmm. uh, sorry, can you I, define what you mean by faith john what 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 your working definition of faith is well I that's that's what so I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm, re um, I'm really picking up on the ath right mm -hmm. so that what faith is is faith is right that continuity of contact that ongoing affordance of affinity that makes us uh, conform more and more to what we think of and what we realize better word, realize as uh, real or more real. So that, like I said, what happens is there, we, and we, these are truths that are only tracked. We can only trace the inexhaustible through our own trajectory of transformation. So that's the emergence, the developmental emergence of mind in, as the capacity for intelligibility. And when that is wedded, to the way in which the world is constantly disclosing itself to us. And, and then the, the two poles of that is there's, there's a disclosure of what the, the moreness than the world can be. And then there is, and it's like two sides of the same tone, but there's also a, a demand put on me to aspire, uh, to tap into the resources of my suchness, what is often called in Buddhism, your original mind, your pure, pure mind. So that I find that potential to trace the trajectory of transframing in a tra in a transjective manner, so I can I can more and more maintain continuity of contact. I think it's entirely appropriate that def the definitions of faith and soul be understood coterminously, because oh, totally, totally, because That's it's it's almost as though faith. Faith is, a, is the described activity of the soul. And so it's really, I think it's impossible to think of them in, as independent dynamics. I think one, one is somehow a property of the other. So that the cultivation of soul manifests in faith and the cultivation of faith manifests in soul. I think it's appropriate to understand yeah. them consistent uh, yeah. in that manner. I, I would say that soul is the term for a power and faith is a term for the virtue uh, that you know cultivates that power towards excellence, the hmm. enacted virtue. So faith is related to virtue. Uh, that's not Very much. I, just I like, wanna, just like, something I wanted to ask you about today yeah. also was this yeah. this word virtue because in Peter Lindbergh's blog uh, there was a big discussion about about virtue and um, and he was saying something like um, he made some kind of comment like. Um, 
he says he loves virtue more than he could love even a woman or his wife or, or yep. If, yep. If, if you that's have that Peter kind of virtue, yeah. that kind of, that's what virtue means. Uh, so yeah. um, that seems to be related to faith as well. Yeah. I, I mean, so I, 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 let me try something that's close and related. Um, uh, and that may help. Because, um, so I think of reverence and here I'm found following Woodruff because he explicitly argues that reverence isn't a feeling or an experience, it's a virtue. Um, he's a little bit less clear about what the virtue is, but exa his, exa his examples um, and the allusions to the Platonic tradition make clear what the virtue is. Uh, virtue is, and this is the other aspect of faith that I'm trying to get at, uh, sorry, reverence is the virtue that puts you into right relationship to awe. Right, so that you are both uh, excellently receptive and excellently, that's the disclosure, and excellently responsive, that's the demand mm -hmm. to the experience of awe, so that you can tap into the fundamental depths of its transformative offering. Um, and so reverence is that virtue. Faith is uh, the more encompassing virtue, uh, uh, the bet, you know, right, like I say that, um, it alludes back to the notion of worship, where we are trying to get into a comprehensive right relationship um, to the unfolding of uh, uh, of transjectivity, the yeah. mutual unfolding of I the individuation of suchness and the participation in moreness. And there's something about faith that means that we're not there yet. We haven't arrived. Yeah, we're, it's inherently we're, not we're incomplete. Uh, we're um, hmm. And I'm trying to, and I mean, Thomas Aquinas did this, and, right? And trying to make this notion of faith, and Chris says it, it, it's coterminous, interdefining with soul, um, trying to make the notion of faith back into a virtue rather than an act of willful assertion, ah. of willful identification. What mm -hmm. you're doing is you're trying to, uh, I think the best way of understanding virtue is a virtual engine. You're trying to create a sense of constraints uh, within between and without, that will help give, get you best disposed reliably to right relationship with the presencing of what's most real. Yeah, yeah. And you're becoming, I mean, faith in some ways, it's, it's you becoming proleptically conversant with the, with the organization of your relationship with the world your relationship with yeah, the, the, the relations that govern and concenter your disposition uh, before let's say reality as such i see faith as a kind of a kind of continuity between the state of those relations in situ and the possibility of transposing or transfiguring those relations in order to accommodate greater levels of intelligibility. There's something like, there's a vertical continuity that you step into when your, when your relation becomes disposed with faith, right? It's like you're stepping in, you're, 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 you're stepping into the Heraclitan current, as it were, right? You're stepping into train with something that's going to that's going to disclose the, the possibility of reorganizing your relations such that you become more optimally disposed to accommodating the world. So, so that's what, here's a way of thinking of what Chris said that I think would help to make it co concrete. Um, think about how you're faithful to your partner, your wife. That's, that's a virtue, right? It's, and, and it's not captured and, and this, we can talk about this. Goes back to what, why your, your you know your self knowledge oh, captured with this. Give me a good thought too. But... Pardon me. Oh, I just had a good thought when you said I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, when you say being faithful to your wife, um, that's an activity, right? Yes, um, that's an activity. If you look inside virtue. your mind, maybe you're not always faithful. You're not. We're not always faithful, right? In our, right. In, our in our hearts and minds. But it's what we do. Uh, so that it just gave me that 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 thought. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And notice how it's interdefining, interdefined with love too. And yeah, I mean, and, and that's like we very make a sacrifice on some level. We might have an attraction to other people or or something yep, like that. Yep. But, yeah. But, but but we make a sacrifice and we decide to to limit ourselves to that that um, that relationship, which actually you know 
makes our horizon larger. Yes, exactly. And that was the point I want to make. Like your faithfulness to your partner isn't about any sense of closure or the fact that she can be captured by a set of beliefs. So when you, mm, the virtue right. of faithfulness is to have, of course you have sentences you utter, but it's also a virtue also uh, requires skills. It requires a sensibility uh, for perspective knowing, right? And, and, and it requires a kind of selfing for the participatory knowing. Virtues, they, do, they, they link all the knowings together such that what's happening is, as you said, you're constantly affording your wife's moreness, right? And how, but always, always in recognition of her suchness. She's not an abstract principle to you. Yeah. So you are affording She's her. not your property or possession or right, any of those right. things. Uh, yeah. That's right. But, otherwise, but she, if you have that kind of relationship, it's a relationship without faith, isn't it? It is. It, but, yeah. So there's definitely that. She's not, she's, so she's not categorical. She has suchness. Yeah. But she's also a doorway to the moreness of the world, right? She's also not just an abstract principle. She's neither just an abstract principle or just a simple concrete thing. She is a person, which is neither an abstract principle nor a concrete thing, but something beyond them, something that Corbin would talk about as ultimately um, imag imaginal. So what I'm trying to say is your relationship of faithfulness in love to your wife is a... Um, it's sort of, it's, it's soulful anagoge. You are affording her souling and she is affording your souling. Mm -hmm. And that's what the faithfulness is. And I mean, and so in Vedanta, you get this uh, taken up into, you know, the central claim, Atman is Brahman, thou art that, right? Mm -hmm. So that the, 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 the mystery of transcendence and the mystery of imminence, the soul of the, of, the, of the reality and the soul of the person are ultimately um, a fine, inter-affordant, inter-penetrating, co-creating. Mm. Beautiful, yeah. I was thinking about, uh, oh, go ahead, uh, Christoph. Uh, like I was to... just gonna say, it also means that, that implicit within that, within the faithful relationship is the capacity for, the capacity for inexhaustible reinventio yeah, of the course. Way that you just mm -hmm. find it, John. Yeah, right? Totally, totally. Because there's something there's something about a faithful relationship that is necessarily unpredictable. I, I think about the womb the womb with a view expression. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That it always has a the, the gnosis of the relationship always has a view to beyond the relationship, and so it's just I mean it's 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 reliable enough to be to be to us to as to avoid absurdity right because when a relationship becomes so unpredictable then it verges into absurdity exactly, but it exactly. is not so predictable as to become um, that's another kind of absurdity as to, right as to, that's right yeah, it's yeah but it's predictable total predictableness is uh, is absurd and it's just as sort of chaos is yeah exactly. it's a virtual engineering so, uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. That's the virtual engineering, right? So, You're trying to steer between those. Yeah. So, so there's something. So the property. So the, the the property of faith in a relationship is that which keeps its poesis ongoing and replenishing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that when you when you turn to the relationship, that's why that's that's why faithful relationships are a font for existential renewal in some mm -hmm. respect, right? Because you find yourself recovered and recollected anew in a faithful relationship, precisely because yeah, it yeah. in intermediates the moreness of the world as well as the moreness of yourself and so the the, the capacity for self police for the, the auto poetic evolutionary quality to a to a faithful relationship is precisely that what makes it a font of inexhaustibility yes and notice wow. notice how as you are participating in the other right mm -hmm. and right like chris chris said you are also internalizing the other you, be, you individuate your suchness through your capacity to internalize other people. Yes. And this is what dialogos is. I mean, this is what dialogos exactly. does, right? This is that, the sacramental exactly. property of dialogos yeah, is precisely exactly. that by the revelation of thou, you are so revealed. Yeah, and yeah. in your revelation, thou is more revealed. And then the cycling that takes place as a consequence of that opens the perspective of the dialogos to the, to the, to the sort of something like the, the ontological vertex that is, that is, available with it with now available by by virtue of in virtue i should say in virtue i love that expression because yeah, I think exactly it says it all. in virtue of that faith in virtue of that 
Hmm. There's right, something that, else that I was thinking about is, is that is the, the uh, erotic aspect. I was just going to do that. And that's because, what, yeah, and, yeah. and, and I, I, in these conversations, often we're a bunch of men talking, it seems to be. Uh, I, there, there are women involved as well, and I hope more and more women get involved. And then there's this invocation of the feminine, which happens. And yeah. then that seems to, to bring the conversation in, be, in soul, the conversation, if I, if I could say so. And I, mean, well, I know well, that. In Hebrew, there, I, I remember that the soul is feminine or the Holy Spirit is feminine. If all in, other, spirits, in other languages, yeah. yes. it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's masculine, but um, I don't know if it's inappropriate. to. to I mean, I, I, I think that way all the time in terms of masculine, feminine polarities, but people seem to get offended when you... Well, I, I prefer the Taoist polarities of yin and yang because they are more comprehensive. They're not limited to biological creatures. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. And then they also dispose us towards not getting overly politicized about something important that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to bring up the, uh, I was going to bring up that connection because the moreness into suchness uh, and, and, and when it sort of affines our individuation to participation, when we get that appropriate tonos, that right relationship, I think that's, that's really the experience of beauty. Where, where, and I want to bring beauty and Han's book on saving beauty and Scarry's book on, Beauty, I think, are really, really important works on recent works on beauty, because because what beauty is is beauty is exactly like Scary says. You know, you you come upon a beautiful tree, and there's two things. You say, "Geez, I didn't realize trees could be like that." Right? There's the moreness, oh. but then you you realize that this tree is somehow in the experience of beauty unique and different from all the other trees. So. Right. So the beauty tree has a soul in a sense. Yeah. yeah. The tree has a soul in a sense, not in any animism. I think no. animism is a, uh, for us, an inaccessible mythos uh, that, that uh, symbolize that uh, correctly. Uh, but yeah, I, I think in that sense, it, it's a kind of animation where animation also means uh, to set things into motion. Uh, right. Uh, so I think beauty is exactly that experience. It, it's like, most of the time we're doing relevance realization because the goal is to produce relevance. But sometimes the relevance realization machinery is in the service of realization. It's in the service of disclosing the moreness into suchness of everything. It's in service of beautifying the world. And that's a kind of flip, uh, right? Where the, uh, you know, the, wor the what I'm trying to do is actually put myself, and this is like the worship and the reverence, I'm trying to put my relevance realization machinery in service. It's not subjectively oriented. I'm putting it in service transjectively to the disclosure in beauty of, you know, how all of the universe had to have existed the way it did for this cup to be the way it is and to be here now the way it is and have all of the properties that it has that you cannot possibly grasp right here, right now. And so, and so this is, and this again, this is a, a notion of, of beauty, not of consumption. Consumption is the most primitive form of conformity. I, I become one with something by consuming it. Plato talks about when you experience beauty, the conformity, it's, you, he says you want to give birth in beauty. The response, right, the part of the right relationship, as Chris said, is poesis. I want to create. I want to do more to afford, right, more and more beauty in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like beauty is like the, it's like the, it's like the physiognomy of the world's mourners. Yes. It's, it's what, it, it's how the mourners presents to us, right? The countenance of the mourners is precisely what strikes us as beauty. So, so and Chris, then, I and then, give a word for this that I think, I think you'd like. I'm going to give it to you and see why I'm going to play it. I think in this self, it's an interface where what we're doing is <laughs> we, can, we can face the world and we give it yeah. a way of facing us. Yes. And, and also, picking, yeah. up, also yeah. picking up on the technological sense of interface as yeah. that yeah. which affines and conforms two things together so they can well, mutually yeah. function together. I thought you might want to play uh, with that. Yeah, mm. I will play with that. Well, I think it's, it's also there's something... Um, in sort of a tongue-in-cheek way, it's also appropriate to this exact circumstance because exactly. what we're doing right now <laughs> exactly. is interfacing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but and I'll, and uh, so go ahead, Andrew. Oh, I'm just going to say that the, the yeah be, the interface being beauty, but there's also a, a, a an ugliness to the idea of interface as well. It's like you need to have this technological barrier. 
between us or something like that. That's just a feeling I got when I, when I heard the word. Yeah, so. yeah and exactly that. And so we, we've got to get out. I, I mean, I want to bring back the face within interface. The this face is why I brought up Tyler in the beginning, because he's, yep. he was talking about this technological platform. And then I had two feelings about that. I had one feeling about, yay, great, low, we can be creative. And then a, a other feeling of like getting completely consumed by, by this mach, machine that is just devouring all our creative, um, yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, acts and, and potentials. I think that's right. Um, I, but I think I think the technology is what it is in the sense. Sorry, that sounds trivializing. What I mean is, um, it is a power that has not been coupled to virtue. Hmm. There, there is nothing in virtue to pick up on Chris in which yet uh, that we have decided, uh, you know, how we're going to actualize the potential of this. You wouldn't want it to be. A vir you wouldn't want a machine to have virtue either. That, that in, in a sense, that has to be a uniquely. Um, well, I don't know about that. I, 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 I mean, I, yeah, I, I actually would argue the other way. I, I think you know, as, as we try to give them intelligence, we better be giving them virtues of rationality and wisdom. But that's another argument. Okay. I think what, what, what Tyler was trying to point out is what's happening on the Discord servers, right, is a particularly powerful way in which people are appropriating the interface medium in order to do interfacing the way I'm talking about it right now. And in order to try and create... Um, the communitas and the distributed cognition for the reculturation of our world, stealing the culture uh, from the way it is now frozen in sort of um, moribund normativities and moribund structures and reculturate. I mean, I, that's what he's if you that's what he's basically mm -hmm. arguing for. Yeah. And so that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, uh, that um, there's a way in which we could virtue we could. Uh, uh, we could appropriate in virtue the potential of this medium um, so that we can reculture uh, uh, in a really powerful way and recognize and reculture and recognize in an interdependent fashion. Um, yeah. and, and, and so the people that attend these, I'm sorry, this will actually circle back around. The people that attend these discord services are there in good faith. Mm -hmm. They're there in good faith, and there's a faithfulness. They don't have an ulterior motive. No, um, they're just doing it f for itself. Because they want to stay wedded to what's emerging. They have a sense of the art. They have a sense of finding themselves and finding the world in the dialogos and the emerging community around it. And so they want. They want. They love the beauty of that and they are seduced in the proper sense of the word by the erotic aspect of it right they are seduced into wanting to maintain continuity of contact with yeah. it so there's this when you say seduction there's this incredible darkness and danger at the same time as that's what i oh. don't want to forget about that right when no, we're, no 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 we're there talking is. about there ever is. yeah yeah there is there I, is go ahead chris i, I, I think philea so i think in some sense Philea, I think, so taking the model of these, these dialogoi, I think is appropriate yeah. because I think what, what the presence of Philea does is it essentially creates a matrix for the cultivation of Eros, right? And for the transmutation of Eros into something like an agapic form of poesis. So, yeah. you know, Eros, Eros, of course, can be creative or consumptive depending on its particular valence. But I think one of the functions of the dialogic practice insofar as it trains and tutors Philea is that it becomes a kind of it becomes a way of performing the beauty of the erotic impulse in a way that it changes its it transforms it yeah. and and i think that the role of philia as a kind of intermediary between the e powerful emergence of the erotic impulse and the possibility of its becoming in other forms, mm -hmm. I think is central. It's, I think that's yeah. why dialogos is fulcral. And I think that's why the cultivate the interpersonal, what we might call, what we have called the, the horizontal dimension of dialogos, which is to say the interpersonal dimension of dialogos, the kind of thing that Guy cultivates in circling, mm -hmm. is so, it's such a fundamental starting point because what it seems to do is it seems to bound the arena of play in such a way that the oh. eros becomes a paratelic exercise that can then be molded and shaped and creatively directed to become 
the birth and beauty to become to become anagogically reproductive. And aga- anagogic when it wants to give birth. And, agop- and it yeah. makes me think of the campfire again. You said you yeah, said there's, of course. There's, there's a circle and mm-hmm. Of course. So, so there's something really, really central then about, and, and I think this will come out, you know, as this, as this, we work to refine this more and more, I think it's going to become really essential to understand how this is sequenced and to understand how it, how, you know, what, what the proper conditions are in order for this to happen reliably. But I think that's why there's something about, there's something about cordoning off the interpersonal arena in such a way then that it becomes a proper symbolic body for the transmutation of Eros. Because you're right, Andrew, it, it can be profoundly destructive and, and it, can feed, it can feed and dilate every narcissistic impulse we yeah. can possibly have. Well, and so it's a very, very careful game that we have to, make, to play to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, when you were talking, I was reminded of you know, my own tradition you know, of, of practices of psychotechnologies, which is Tantra and, and Tantric Buddhism. And, and of course, Tantric Buddhism is not about removing those kind of darknesses or, or those kind of passions or those kind of... It's not about doing away with them. It's, about, it's always about transmutation or transformation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, mm-hmm. so, so, I mean, the, let's remember, we are talking, and it's appropriate that we are, we're talking about soul and faith, but we're also talking love and beauty. We're also talking about virtue. And, and that's why the virtues that are cultivated to ameliorate and help us perhaps grow out of self-deceptive behavior is bound up in this reason, rationality. And Andrew, you know that I have a much broader view of this. Yes, that, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think reason, uh, 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 rationality, and ultimate you know the interpenetration of the intellectual virtues like reason and the ethical virtues like courage right they come together in that superlative uh, virtue which is wisdom you know mm-hmm. people have to be cultivating wisdom so dialogue dialogos and this is the point that uh, you know uh, that well, I, I don't mean to make it sound like guy is not responsive he's been immensely responsive to it but to bring back you know, the sapiential aspiration to bring back the cultivation of wisdom into, right, these dialogic practices. That's one of the core things of dialectic, right, is, is to have the deep interpenetration of the, right, the recognition re- and remembering and realization of uh, self-deception coupled to, Right, the participation in the overflow that's afforded by dialectic. They, they are. Your point, Andrew, actually says one of the things I've been arguing for. Philosophia is not just circling. It's not just interpersonal intimacy. Yeah. It's and that intimacy shifts on to intelligibility itself, and is governed by a normativity of overcoming self-deception. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the 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 interpersonal intimacy is is a symbol on. It's not for itself. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. It's put for. It's it's a symbol on that is put for as a bridge into the service of the kind of self transcendence that you're describing. That's and and then when it it's 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 a symbol on for the purpose of cultivating the faith of proleptic rationality, right? In Kellard's sense of the term. And it's totally. symbolized by union, right? Some kind of union. Um, well, well, it, it, in tantric it, symbology, it's always a, it's yeah. an image of, it's of sexual union, right? Of the Blending. dynamic of the dynamic process and the, you know, it's it's almost it's what are they? Wisdom and, and compassion, or or uh, rationality and, um, and and energy, or something like that. Yeah. All of those. It's a wedding, right? Yeah. It's yeah. drawing the two together. Yeah. And also the it picks up on this phenomenological experience of, of quasi divine revelation that we yeah, have yeah. in the throes of intimate disclosure. I mean, that's the yeah. thing, right? That's the, that's, that's what marks intimate relationships of any variety, platonic or non platonic, right? Is that there's something about the relationship that um, there's something about the, the reflective capacity of that relationship to provide endless novelty in the form of your own understanding of yourself and in the form of your understanding of the other person, right? The sensibility transcendence of it yeah. is such that it, it is, it is, it is endlessly, dis- infinitely discoverable 
right? There's a property of it that is infinitely discoverable. And so then that property becomes host, I think, to the kind of infinite discoverability home. that happens in maybe anagogic. Home maybe, home, maybe home is better than host, right? Um, and it's always, yeah, well, that's, oh, but I like going like, beyond like itself it because it picks up on the sacramental ah, uh, oh, valence the of the exercise. Oh, but I right. think home is also appropriate. It's both really. No, oh, that's good. That's good. I like that. That's really good. So, I mean, you know, uh, again, to pick up on the, the worship, all of this is uh, to, you know, to, to get back into sort of uh, a liturgical relationship. Uh, uh, it's amazing world. how religious these discussions are becoming, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, despite the, you know, Fairly. even though we're, we're the religion, uh, we're speaking of the religion that is not the religion. It, yes. It's more deeply religious almost the more we get into all these things and we, we find that, but all these notions like faith and, and the worship and, and, and um, you know, transcendence but, are, are, are really what find, it's all about, right? But we also find virtue. And we yeah. also find wisdom. We also find rationality. That's yeah. why I, I almost always affix Socratic to faith, Socratic faith. Um, mm -hmm. Because th that's what's so amazing about Socrates is the way he weds himself, and he, right, to the other. Um, and that's is commented on in the in the dialogues, um, because he's a tipos. He has a suchness about him that allows him to reform himself to anybody he's with, right? And he he's a, a sort of a midwife to them. He helps them yeah. give birth, but he also has this faith in the logos. He is willing to follow the argument, and this is why it also requires the virtue of courage. He's willing to follow the argument wherever it goes. Yeah. And it seems it always goes. I, I was reading Socrates this morning um, because of you guys. I, I have, I've, for the first time, I'm reading him directly. Of course, I've, I've read him through other people. And, and the, the last part of the chapter was, you know, he comes up to all these pseudo conclusions about things. And then he, suddenly he says, well, we don't know, actually what we're talking about here, you know, <laughs> yeah. at the very end of the chapter. I, I thought like there's a humor there that I, I didn't know. There is. Socrates. There is. Um, and it's so just important. He yeah, trapped an, this person yeah. into, into like thinking he had this grandiose understanding of something. But really the whole point was that, that once you've understood something, you, you don't know anything anymore. You're, you're at, at, at the beginning again. Or This gets taken up in the Neoplatonic uh, practice. Uh, so so the, the Neoplatonic universe in is one in which think, there's the absolute pure oneness of the one, and then things emanate. They proceed out to all the various multiplicitous instantiation, and then everything right returns. This is not a temporal process. This is what's happening in ontology. Mm -hmm. And the idea in dialectic is you're supposed to do the same thing. You're supposed to project all of your thoughts, all of the variations you have, and then notice all the differences, and then recollect and say, yes, but that's just a projection. And, only, and yeah. then when you recollect, recollect back, right, and try and step back to what's deeper and what's affording all of the variations, that's when you realize, oh, well, but I don't really know it. And then you gather, this is how you practice dialectic, you gather it back in, and then you again project it out so that you externalize it, you can become aware of it, right, and, and then you see all the variations and, you, and then you pull it back in. It. And, you, and you don't stop, you just keep going back and forth because you're trying to get into conformity with how, how, how reality is unfolding in that constant pr procession and, ret and, and return. And what's really cool for me is that's exactly the main motion in artificial intelligence, deep learning, right? You take some data and you can compress out what's underneath them all, the one, and then you run variations from that, see what sticks, gather it back in, right? And vary it out, project it out, recollect it in, project it out, recollect it in. And that's how this, that's what, how these networks evolve their capacity to pick up on complex patterns in the world. That's what gives them their intelligence. Right. Right. Wow. And then I guess, I guess too, then that, that Neoplatonic process that in that Neoplatonic process, beauty is really the kind of hypostatic emissary, right? Yeah. That signals the realism of that process and, um, yes. and allows you to track and follow it more Yep. perhaps more, more, um, oh. more reliably. You I think get, it allows you not to be stuck in your tracks somewhere. Yeah. Um, yes. It, it, it's like it, it, it seduces you forward all the time. Yep. So that yes. you're not, you're not, uh, you know, you I just, think, you don't fall asleep by the side of the road or. You know. I think beauty is the mark of knowing by loving. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Yeah. I think that's, that's its point. Um, and, I, and I mean, originally, of course, the, 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 the identification was, you know, purely sexually, uh, but of course, what, you know, what Chris has been describing repeatedly to great effect is what we're really doing is we're exacting that and we're, we're using, because we're, we're not just biological creatures, we're cultural creatures. And we're, we have to perpetually, re, we have to re-sacralize -sacral, the culture. Cultus is, you mm -hmm. know, ultimately, right, the place of worship and cultivation to, to you, 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 you participate in something growing with a life of its own, right? All of this, we have to re-sacralize Right? As we're reculturing, we're also simultaneously resacralizing uh, all of those aspects of ourselves that are properly designated as cultural and not just biological. And one of the and the and the central thing for this are these related terms, person, self, and soul. Mm -hmm. Those are all ultimately, I'm not I'm not reducing them to in a Durkheimian fashion to being merely cult culturally constructed or anything like that, but they are places, well, they are the primary poles through which we interface with culture and also afford the culture interfacing with the reality in which it is always embedded and upon which it always depends. Mm. Yeah. Well put, John. Yes, and Andrew, you're right. This is all, in some sense, in service of the religion that's not a religion. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and trying, I, took, I have taken very seriously the, the, the loving criticisms made by Paul Van de Klee, Mary Cohen, um, and Jonathan Pajot. I've taken them to heart. Mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed something, and I'm really, I'm really trying to fret a flag it and celebrate it that when I listen to other people's criticisms and you know and take them to heart and what I can often do is I can start to internalize them into new ways of thinking new paths of research Jonathan criticized me in that you know I, I, I was talking about as if it's all individual mystical practices and so this is why I got so involved uh, with this the distributed cognition it led into the whole project of dialectic Mm -hmm. and communitas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, communitas. And then Paul mm -hmm. talks, and you know, Paul talks repeatedly of you know the scalability problem, both developmentally and across various hierarchies of competence and power. And I take that very seriously as well. It's trying to say, okay, how can we reinventio all of these polarities, all these tonoses of individuation and participation, so that we can make them accessible and scalable? Yeah. It's interesting. I was talking to this very um, in, in in Paris, uh, in France, very well known um, meditation teacher, uh, Buddhist meditation teacher, the other day, and um, I was talking to him about Buddhism, and my sense that B Buddhism in the West has sort of gone awry on on, yeah. on some level, um, and I and I said, what what is the use of Buddhism? What, what, um, and he said, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have any use, you know, maybe it's, it's, um, but, but it's just, there's, I, there's, I just love these practices and, and this kind of thing. And, and he said his own teacher, Chogam Trimpa, was trying to look for something kind of beyond Buddhism, right? Something that would be larger and would not be, um, uh, that would, you know, he would make a meditation available to people uh, rather than have it being, um, some kind of uh, you know special esoteric technique, yeah, yeah. or something like something that's really available to to, to people. Or, who cares if you're a Buddhist or a Christian or or, or, or whatever or, on some level? I mean, I mean, who cares? I mean, well, I, I've been playing because I've been doing going back to Nishitani in the Kyoto School. Had an excellent conversation with Jared Morningstar. What a great name, by the way, Jared Morningstar, mm -hmm. about Nishitani because uh, you know because he's he for for me he's a primary example of, uh, you know, of an epochal philosopher bridging between East and West, mm. reconceiving, uh, you know, religion, religion and nothingness. I will recommend this book till I die. It's one of the top five books. I would put it on the shelf beside Plato. I just ordered it actually because yeah. it, you and then, then there's some good books to order in conjunction with it. Oh. You should definitely order uh, these two if you get a chance, uh, Andrew. There's the Kyoto School by Robert E. Carter. Uh -huh. 
he taught in Canada, by the way, at Trent University. Oh, really? There's this new one, The Religious Philosophy of Nishi, Nishitani Keji. Uh, uh, so uh, I've been, you know, really, really uh, playing around with this idea uh, and, uh, uh, of, uh, of something like Zen Neoplatonism, uh, uh -huh. because the two, would, the, the two would constantly undermine each other. Sure. But they, they, the Zen was trying to undermine itself all the time. And yeah. Zen, you would so say, it, Zen, you would say there's something called the stink of Zen, and that's when you become too yeah. religious. And, and, and Neoplatonism was always, always trying to do the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 that, and, 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 you know, if we could somehow integrate um, them together, like I say, because they, they're not, they're, uh, if you'll allow me to play with the wed, wedding metaphor, they're not going to sleep easily together in the same bed. But I, I expect that would be actually really, really uh, a, a really good creative tension that would, prov would keep, well, perhaps keep a kind of criticality uh, for longer before things, everything eventually solidifies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But maybe keep the fire of criticality burning a little bit longer. Oh yeah. What I wanted to say about my discussion with this uh, this person also was that he mentioned that, you know, he said each each period that we live in has this denial, uh, denial of love. He called it. Yeah. And he would say that you know in the religious era, right when people were highly religious, you know, uh, you would burn somebody at at the stake or, or or something like that, and that was the denial of love, right? Somebody who wasn't a Christian, you'd, yeah. you'd burn them at, at the stake, or if somebody wasn't a Buddhist, they were a heretic and. And, and all that sort of thing, and he says, but but our but our denial. He was he was he he's written a lot about our cultural denial today as this commodification of, of, oh, yeah. of everything, where where um and this pseudo happiness uh, search for for. And he was talking about how meditation, you know, is usually taught as being this panacea to make somebody to make you calm and and yeah, yeah. Uh, and, no, and that's, no. that's, that's that's sort of thing and and. And that that actually the spirit of it it should be more in and that spirit of all these sorry I'm rambling here but all these um, techniques like impermanence that people use they've they've turned into this sort of description of reality that's very obvious and and, yeah. and stupid and they just you just use these phrases but yeah. but I think I think the dialogos would would I, you I always have so. to to keep the 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 soul and intelligence of of, of something I think I think so I, I mean. I mean, I think Han has been the best for talking about our incapacity for love now, our denial for love in um, the way in which we have turned everything into consumption and commodified everything. And he also has talked about uh, a, a correlated thing, was, and this allows us to circle back because of the way love and beauty are bound together. Uh, he, he has this wonderful chapter where he talks about um, the aesthetics of the smooth, that yeah, you were we, mentioning that, right? Yeah, that we want, we want this, like we want, we 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 have, we have re-identified. But his point is, we have misidentified beauty with the, with making things as smooth as possible, visually, cognitively, interpersonally. And his point is that what we are doing then is uh, is this grand act of narcissism. Because so what we're basically saying is, um, I don't want anything to disturb me. Or disrupt mm -hmm. me, um, and, and that's, this comes back to your point that meditation. I, when I'm teaching them my meditation classes, I'm doing them. Uh, I don't know if you knew that, Andrew. I'm doing yeah, them I did. I did. I did know that. Yeah, I've already burdened. Otherwise, I'd I'd love to come, but uh, no, no, no. That wasn't. I wasn't trying to. Yeah. Probably, no, no. Why I, 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 I repeatedly tell my students, you know, that meditation is not a vacation. It's an education. It should disturb you. And if you're yeah. having unpleasant, disturbing feelings, good, yeah. good. Right, the people that come in and all they want to do, and they want to talk about how they feel wonderful. You know, it, it is appropriate at times to celebrate wonder and connectedness and presence. Yeah. But you should also have periods where there is demand and yeah. challenge on you. Yeah, and 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 I guess you also have to go into the underworld. That's what this guy was telling me today about. You know, the poet has to go into the underworld and and look at the dark aspects. Um, of your of your world and 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 of yeah. yourself and mm -hmm. and all that and that's also part of meditation which well but you see that 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 the the you know the gnostic and jungian metaphors are ultimately wed to that neoplatonic practice that i was talking about because what do you do well how do you really journey into the underworld Well, you try to notice how you're projecting your shadow here's the projection and all the way and 
you, it's, I mean, you really can't introspectively get at your shadow. Um, uh, and, mm. and, and the point is that I'm taking shadow, not just in the Because it's too hard to look at, you mean? It's, it's, you're not. No, no, it, because you, it's, uh, you, you, where you have to get to a place where I, I want to play with Nietzsche's thing. You can't jump over your own shadow, right? It, it, it is immersed in the very activity that uh, of your looking at your uh, at the shadow. It's, it, it's enmeshed. It's like this. Let me give It's deeply like this. You are so wise with other people. You can give your friend amazingly good advice, right? But trying to do that for yourself is almost impossible. In fact, that's a hallmark of wisdom where people can, can successfully do that. And what you have to do, and this is why, and this is Moore's point about self-knowledge requires distributed cognition. And Sperber's point, rationality requires distributed cognition. Because only in you, like reflecting back on me, like my projections, and if we can, and if we can, if, if, if we can move that from being an unconscious process of co-identification to an explicit one, like in therapy, right? Only then can I recover from my projections what has been otherwise inaccessible to me. That's how I can integrate, which means individuate, right, with the shadow. The shadow is the disruptive things that I have to project out so I can see them the way, like how literacy makes your thoughts available to you. Mm -hmm. And then I can, from that, gather back in and gather in that criticality. And that's what actually individuates me and moves me forward. Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I mean, and this is what Jung thought. I mean, dreams are a little bit weird because dreams are sort of other, they're sort of alternatives to your ego mind. Um, but it's very, I mean, this is one of the things when you're reading Socrates, Socrates spends a lot of time putting people into a poria because he wants to disabuse them of all these incorrect yet intuitively obvious ways of how we get self-knowledge. Well, I just introspect. Bullshit. You will not get a lot of, most of yourself will not be found, right? Oh, well, what I do is, you know, just, 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 uh, uh, you know, just the things I'd like or choose. No, that's bullshit too, right? Well, the things that I sort of, you know, uh, assent to. Well, no, that's not enough because I don't know what you're committed to, what the true normativity of you is until I see you having to interact with things that disturb you and disrupt mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you. I mean, I think Moore's book is brilliant about this. It's just bringing out that there is so much aporia in Socrates because he's trying to get people to give up our feigned and fallacious sense of expertise about our own self-knowledge. This is what we also lost with the notion of a soul. If you go back into you know, the Christian tradition, the soul was deeper. It was that part of you. It was the God-given part of you, right? It was that part of you that transcended your self-awareness because it was that part of you that is you know, striving for relationship to what is ultimate, God. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Socrates' process of aporia is to humiliate, in the old meaning of the term, people's pretended expertise, which is a kind of arrogance, right, yeah. about their own self-knowledge. Because it has to be found in dialectic. I, I mean, this is now, the, the convergence of this ancient argument that self-knowledge is only available in dialectic and this new modern argument uh, by people like Sperber and my good friend, uh, Greg Henriques, that, right, that reason, it, reason was designed by evolution to work within distributed cognition, not just inside people's heads. Mm. That's very clear, yeah. Mm. So if you have a confirmation bias and I have a confirmation bias, but they aren't the same confirmation bias, you know what we'll do? We will come in with our confirmation biases, and if we, if we come in good faith, let's, yeah. right? You and I will disrupt each other. Yeah. We will disturb each other out of it in ways we can't do with our own cognition. Now, I'm not saying you can't do things like journaling and cultivating active open-mindedness. You have to do those. You have to do those too. But there's a, there's a place that you and I can get to in dialectic that we cannot get to on our own. Yeah, yeah. There's a place of self-knowledge that we can get to in dialectic that we cannot get to on our own. Because we have to disclose who we are be before and, an, and another person, to, right? We have to externalize it, and we have to give up ownership over what we're saying mm. and doing and let other people appropriate it 
and transform it before our very eyes. This is the thing that you, you face, right, when, you're, when you realize the performative aspect of your cognition. It is always going to get away from you. I, I used to carry this slogan. I don't like Sartre very much. I used to carry the slogan around and use it sort of very um, uh, one-sidedly. One but he said, you never complete a book. You only abandon it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the one meaning of that is you can't bring things to closure. But yeah. now, now I realize there's a bigger thing. Because as I start to put stuff out into the world, I realize what that abandonment is. It's, those things are going to take on a life of their own within distributed cognition. And they're going to get to places that I could never have gotten to with them. Hmm. I, I'm thinking again of this whole thing of uh, Moses not getting to the promised land, right? He's, you, you, this is our lives. We build this whole thing. Uh, and uh, in, in some sense, we have to deal with the kind of disappointment of where, where we, we will lead to or, or we have to give up our, our, our you know, pr project um, yeah. and, and offer it to others in, in a sense. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, part of what we need to do is, right, yeah, to, to shift, and this is, this is my deep, I mean, you know that I love the Platonic tradition deeply, but this is my deep critique of what goes wrong in the Platonic tradition, which is um, the, the conjoining of sacredness with uh, perfection, and where perfection is a coming to rest. Um, mm. uh, the later Christian uh, Neoplata Neoplatonic Christians replaced this with epictasis, that we are, all, we are, in, a we are, we are in permanent self-transcendence, that mm -hmm. God is the field that affords a permanent self-transcendence. Yeah, yeah. And the vision of God is not to see God in rest, yeah, but to yeah. more and more see the way God sees. So right? there's no final resting point or nirvana or enlightenment or, you know, here, I'm, no. I'm, I'm home now. <laughs> it's more like... Um, Continual. Well, is there is there a final resting point in your relationship with your spouse? Do you now say, "I'm done. I've completed love." We don't complete any virtues. We don't complete virtues. And thinking that they even complete us is incorrect, right? Your love for your wife, your faithfulness to her, those are incompletable projects. They're what. Yeah. They're what. Um, John Cars. John Cars wrote, wrote this brilliant book, The Religious Case About Belief, and then he this finite and infinite games. Right. Virtues are infinite games. They're games that are not meant to end like a good conversation, like a good dialogos. Mm -hmm. right? And virtues are always infinite games. That's one of Plato's yeah. great insights. That's why we can never be completely virtuous. Only the gods are capable of that infinity. Hmm. So that's why I can't be completely virtuous. <laughs> well, but, but, but. I don't mean to make a joke. That's that's no, 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 yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, um, fun. That's fine. That's that's very. It, good. Well, it also makes me think that our our beauty is in our imperfection, which is kind of it's 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 a terror and it's a relief at the same time. Well, that's what Rilke said, right? That every yeah. beauty is an angel that's just slightly failing to kill us, right? And you know, in the uh, in the Asiatic, there's Asiatic aesthetics of you know of Wabe, that. You know, and, and this brings broken us back. Broken cup to, or something. Yeah, yeah. the broken mm -hmm. cup. Because what does the crack do? It reminds us, being mode, of the suchness of this, mm. right? But it, all, all, at the same time, it's exposing us to how everything, right, it's tapping into the inexhaustibleness. Because what happens when I catch the suchness because of the crack, the cup is beautified. And the yeah. moreness of reality speaks through. It's like Leonard Cohen's line. There's a crack in everything. There's a crack in everything, yeah. Yeah, so the light can shine in. And also in, in the Japanese aesthetics, they say that uh, uh, it's like a, a woman or a man who's just beyond that prime. That, that they, they consider that to be beauty. Not, not, yeah. Not something in its prime perfection of life, but if it's somebody that has gone just beyond the prime, um, so that it contains life and death within it. It's yep. it's, it's it's not this false promise of, of perfection. Yes. yes, excellent. That's exactly right. I think that's a yeah. beautiful thing you just said. Mm. And so, notice how we can't talk about these things without all of these uh, all of these nodal terms coming up: beauty, love, wisdom, faith, soul. Right. Mm. I think and, there's a particular, go ahead, Chris, go ahead, please. particularly beautiful analogy to be made um, about the role of, analogically, the role of silence. Mm. And the, the, so, you know, one of the things, if I can sort of 
use this metaphorically, at least at first, one of the things that happens in a disclosing dialogue is that the, the silence by which you are heard deepens and appreciates the meaning of what is spoken. Now, the silence in the margins of any given utterance is always infinitely greater and more engulfing than the speech that's proffered into it. So there's a way in which that the silence is infinitely appreciative of sound, but sound also contains the presence of that silence, right? As though between the notes of music, as though between the syllables of speech. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that happens, I think, when a relationship becomes loving and faithful in all of the ways in which we've just defined it, the silence of the relationship becomes more and more pregnant. Yeah. So you become accustomed to speaking into the silence of the listening ear, knowing that whatever is spoken into that silence appreciates by virtue of the fact that it was spoken into that particular form of attentive silence. And then when, and then when, when that relationship becomes more and more knowing, its particular, its particular auditing silence becomes something that you can internalize more and more, right? Which I think is in many ways what Augustine's project was with his confessions, right? He's speaking into the silence, into a thou of silence that is infinitely knowing and infinitely knowable. And so is hearing himself heard in the, in, in, in the property of that silence. And so it's like the relationship, so it goes going back to your relation to the, to the tension between such and more, for instance, that there's a way in which the tension between such and more can be analogized by the relationship between sound and silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that the more yeah. encompassing of the silence that the sound becomes, the more the logos of it deepens, 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 and appreciates. Mm. And so to me, I think that that's a way of understanding both the dynamic, the dynamic of the comprehending relationship as a, as a, as a, 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 as a symbolon for poetic love and its self-transcendence, but also then its capacity to, to be interiorized as a way of performing the dialectic interiorly. Because I agree, John. I mean, there's a way in which we cannot, we cannot self-introspect reliably to the degree that we can do so in a distributed fashion. But then when the distributed dynamic becomes interiorized, it does become a way, obviously, internalizing the sage, as you often say, it becomes a way of cultivating that practice it, within, the, it, within the confines of your inner life. But I think that has everything to do with, with it's not as though you're just importing a dialogue and then running no, it on. No, 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 I know. What, the, thing, the thing that you're internalizing is not the speech made by the other person. It's the particular comprehending ear of silence that they lend to your speech and thereby pronounce its moreness. Okay, I want I want to riff on that because that was beautiful and music. I I felt I felt I, I, two thoughts came to me and that was music and clairvoyance. There's a kind of clairvoyance that happens between uh, people. two people and, and musicians when they're playing together. And go ahead, John. Well, I I want to play. I want to I want to invoke both senses of the term articulation, which is to you know to speak, but also to break things into their parts, right? And what Chris has just made me realize what she often does, is the way in which the silence is in, internalized into the articulation of our intelligibility. Um, and that, Me too, yeah. I got that. And, that, and that the way aporia are those moments of, it depends, you have to have, have cultivated the correct receptivity, but aporia is the, those moments of silence in which you appreciate the moreness that is beyond you. Right, and, and it, it demands a transformation for you. And so what I'm suggesting is uh, one of the things we do in dialectic is we learn to seek those aporias that articulate our intelligibility in just the way Chris articulated, or just the way he articulated. I'm reminded of uh, Antisthenes when asked, because he didn't write the volumes that Plato wrote, he asked, what did he learn from Socrates? And he said something, and all right, he said, well, I learned how to converse with myself. And everybody was kind of like, what? What he meant was just what Chris said. He had yeah. spent so much time living with Socrates, mimetically, right, that he had internalized the Socr that so Socratic process, and he was capable now, after only practicing it years oh, in dialectic, of doing it himself. 
Uh, so, so dialectic is not just a, um, a social behavior. It's also, um, it's, it's something you do, uh, you know, you speak with God in a sense, or that's totally. what you look, that's what you Absolutely. learn how to do. Absolutely. You learn how to speak with, with Absolutely. divine Absolutely. nature. And that's when you're the most, yeah. that's when you arguably think. that's, that's it's That's if, if the process if has there's a, a fruition, launch, that's, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Right. The epictasis. I mean, the Neoplatonists, it's, it's all, I think, uh, very um, implicit in Plato, um, but the Neoplatonists bring out those two dimensions very clearly. In fact, they go a little too far. They tend to emphasize, if you'll allow me, the vertical ontological aspect of dialectic within mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the discourse with the, one's own soul, right? Uh -huh. And that's how Plato, by the way, defined dialectic, you know, uh, uh, discourse with your soul. Right? Mm -hmm. They tended to emphasize this, but there was, that's because they, had, they, they lived in a school and it was so taken for granted that the ontological, right, right, mm. in, intrapersonal was embedded into an existential interpersonal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a community. Both, both, both are always there, mutually yeah. informing and transforming each other. Chris, Chris and, and, I, I, and that's something, and that's something that Socrates, I mean, he, he, alongside the socialized dialogues in Plato, Socrates, I mean, I think that's what's represented by those moments of reverie that Socrates famously has when he pauses for hours at a time to yeah. listen to his daimon, right? That's the, that's the, that's the interiorized exaptation of the socialized dialectic uh, in, the for, in the epictasis form that you've just described. Yeah, Socrates makes it clear that the examination of others, the Socratic examination of others, is always, for reasons we've already articulated, always, always also a self-examination. And Socrates, uh, I forget which dialogue it is, but he says, you know, after I'm done talking with you, I always remember that there's a man waiting for me at home that I have to talk to. And that's his own soul. Yeah. Yeah. And then it kind of feeds back too, though, doesn't it? Because for for like the 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 dialectic that Socrates carries on with his daimon also is what is also what indicates the kairos of the socialized oh, dialogues totally, totally, yeah. and the point of his entry into those dialogues. Right? He's guided he's guided all the while by his inward dialectic, and and that's what that's I think that's precisely what tutors him to guide the socialized dialectic as effectively as he does, right? So there's like, there, there are two concentric circles running on one another yeah, I think throughout so. the entire corpus. I think uh, that internal dialectic, you know, transforms the mind into, into an, uh, uh, so it, it's, it's able to achieve a, a, a state in process that is in deep conformity uh, with the states in process of distributed cognition and ultimately of the environment. I think dial dialectic is ultimate, because it is an act of love, it's ultimately about transforming yourself so you more and more have the perspicacious capacity to enter into conformity with the logos and then through the logos into conformity with ontos, with being. Mm -hmm. That's how you get ontological. You, you, know, you, 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 you get into affinity with the logos, conformity with it, and then through the logos, you get into affinity with ontos, with being. Mm -hmm. and I was think, just thinking as you were speaking that it's, this is very high conceptual stuff, but also it's very simple at the same time, you know? Totally. It, totally. It's a conversation you're having with your wife or your children or, 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 or when, you know, you, you go for a walk and you look at a exactly. tree. Exactly. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not all the, this complexity of, of con con concepts. It's that's just the being attuned to reality, right? Being attuned yes, to that's scalability. Is. That's the thing that Paul is, keeps looking for. And there's a scalability of discourse that is scale. That, well, that's exactly it. it. You know, as soon as we are persons, we are in discourse because we become persons through discourse, right? And so, yes, this is very, in some sense, it can reach up or reach down, whichever metaphor you want, into the very foundations of your fundamental framing of reality and how you're being, you know, framed to reality and by reality, right? All of that. It can reach to that, as you said, this very high conceptual stuff, but it is practicable in the most, and I don't want this to sound like an insult, in the most mundane discourse that you can engage in. 
Mm-hmm. So this is what I mean about it being scalable because every disc, it, like nobody has to be an expert in Neoplatonic philosophy to have found themselves in a conversation that takes on a life of its own and takes all of the participants to places they couldn't get to on their own. Everybody knows that. Everybody has the capacity to practice that. Mm-hmm. All we are trying to do is articulate this more and more and more theoretically but also with, with practicable consequences so we can afford its, in, I know, its enhancement, its acceptation because of our current situation and because of the emerging potential of, this, of these media and these new communities of practice. We have to somehow exact ancient dialectic into the current, you know, into these current n- new communities of practice and this new medium of communication yeah so it's an ensouling process yes mm. yeah back yeah, to precisely. the words. back to soul again and, and you know and that that's a big part of uh making no that's the wrong verb exactly the wrong word that's a big part of affording somebody becoming a person mm. right that ensouling process and, 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 and what's, what's really interesting is... Yeah, so a soul, it just, I, sorry, a soul is not something we have with, that we're born with. A soul is something we become in soul through, through time. Yep. Through, I, like, I like, in fact, yeah. making it a verb mm-hmm. the way you have and, and, a, and a verb that picks up on like connections to embodiment and enactment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it is. And so, I mean, this is, again, this is a way of trying to reinventio some of the practices of theurgia in the ancient world where where they were sort of practicing sort of animating things and we look at that and go that's weird magic Uh, and you know and i don't doubt that there was there was degraded forms of it in which it's weird magic but there were also really powerful forms of it because you know Procus, for example says that uh, internal theurgia is way more important than external uh, theurgia and what it was is about this process right like you said of ensouling things um, uh, uh, of reanimating them, setting them back into their proper motion. The, 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 you know, s- psyche is wind blowing. It's a, it, 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 it's a self-moving thing. When we when we can deeply remember sati, how everything is suke, everything is self-moving. How the logos is not just a set, but a continual gathering and unfolding. Like that that reanimation, mm. so that we're constantly remembering the moreness into the suchness. That was also a big part of, uh, of this whole set of ritual practices that we dimly understand called theurgia in the ancient world. So you're supposed to always be practicing theoria, you know, contemplation, meditation, yeah. reflection, and theurgia. And, and then that was also ultimately supposed to lead to theosis. You're going to become more and more godlike by doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I thought of the uh, the de- reanimating the Death Star again. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. that image came came back to me again. Well, well, well the zombie is, is, image, right, the yeah. zombie is 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 uh, is the horror of of uh, of what reanimation looks like when it cannot be properly housed within a worldview. Yeah. It, it's it's horrific reanimation, right? Um, yeah. Well, reanimation is the wrong word, um, I guess. Yeah, ensouling. I, I like my word ensouling. Yeah. But so that's a, a way of thinking about it is the zombie is a resurrect, uh, is re- resurrection without any ensoulment. Uh huh, sure. I, I mean, part of it, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the difficulty with darkness is, you know, it stands for many things as a term. Um, mm-hmm. Because there's a way in which the darkness is to the light as the silence is to the sound. Um, so that, there's that sense of darkness. The cure of holy darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a sense in which a lot of what we might think of darkness is just the otherness of things and their capacity uh, to disturb us and disrupt us. Now, we can either resist that and harden against it, or we can, like Rilke was was saying, we can get an adaptive uh, relationship to it so that it starts to disclose itself as beautiful. Mm-hmm. And beautiful doesn't mean comfortable, doesn't mean smooth. I like that yeah. point in The Lord of the Rings 
where Galadriel is considering taking the one ring and she said, I will be like, I will be beautiful like the sea. Or what is it? You know, oh, all yeah. terrible and all men will fear me. And you go, whoa. And that's the sense of beauty that Rilke is talking about. So I'm trying to get, Andrew, that the beauty that I'm talking about is not the smoothness. It yeah. is exactly that kind. It, it has awe within it. And, yeah. and the sense in which... What it's it, not this false luminosity or, or love and light, no. which actually is is a very dark thing because it's a denial of, you know, the other half well, of, of life. This was part it's, of the, uh, the, tr- the, the, the transformation of the Lucifer metaphor, the, the, the light bearer. And that the idea became, yeah. and this goes so much with bullshitting, is that Lucifer bears the light that misdirects your salience and, 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 right, and, 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 and makes you not seek the good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, you were going to say something. Chris, say something, please. I was just, I was just going to, <laughs> It's always a pleasure to hear you talk. So. No, no, no. I, well, I was just going to say that, that yeah, be, I mean, beauty. Be, the idea of, of beauty as something that necessarily that necessarily destroys and recreates yourself yeah. that if that that the, the roughness of beauty and and also the rough, roughness of love is such that you cannot encounter it without being so changed yeah. and if you can encounter it without being so changed then it has been it is less than um yeah. it is less than it is less than the fullness of its nature uh, it is it is less than the fullness of love if you can encounter it without also being transformed by it. So there has to be a crack in everything, uh, you know. Uh, there has to be a, yeah. like uh, the, the one of the th- things about Leonard Cohen is his, his voice became more beautiful when he lost his voice, you know. And yeah. same with a lot of singers who who have these broken voices. Somehow they're more powerful when, when they've been broken, or, or some aren't though because it's, they represent. Some aren't, sure. Yeah, that prime. But they I mean, still have a, even the ones that are that are very pure or whatever still have a unusual, strange quality to them. Oh yeah, they're yeah, they're, yeah. Not, they're not um, well, it gets not, they're not surprising in some way, right? Yeah, I was going to say the Neoplatonists picking up on what Chris just said. Uh, really understand the process, uh, and this is like so of giving birth, and the and Socratic is the midwife, and they talk a lot about. The, the, the strain and pain of labor that goes into giving birth. And that if you try to give birth, and think about how a concept is ultimately based on conceive, mm-hmm. right? Um, if, you, if you try to give birth without the pain of labor, you will have a stillborn entity. Mm-hmm. Which, right? That's profound, yeah. yeah. But it's also hopeful because... Yeah. Yeah, it's also a hopeful thing because you you can't avoid the pain of birth, right? It's nothing something that nobody can can very, avoid. Very, very destructive. Pain indicates a pain is the real indication of the real potential of real death. That's what pain is. It's it's it is your mortality taking you by the throat. And right. but let's remember that before medicine, right? Before modern medicine, in a quarter of births, there was a death of the mother of the child or the mother and the child. Yeah. Birth was always a very dangerous thing in the ancient world. That's why midwives are so important because right, they help to mitigate um, our mortality um, so that we can give birth. Mm. And that's what yeah. dialectic is. Yeah. Which is what inflects the process with its share of danger, which I think is something that's not adequately appreciated about this process about the dialectic about philosophy in general because we're too comfortable is is that it's dangerous and and you know and the the association of wisdom with danger i think is not intuitive for a lot of people um i don't know that it would have been intuitive to me either before undertaking it but every instance of it risks a form of dispossession that is utterly utterly destructive and that is, I think, necessarily so, just as, just as love is, just as love does. And so I think that um, its, its darkness has to be properly manifest in order for its sapiential promise to be fulfilled. 
Mm-hmm. That's why it's the dark night of the soul. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought of this notion of, of sacrifice um, as well. Uh, there was that was one thing I, I wanted to talk to you, uh, you guys about is, is the notion of sacrifice and the scapegoat, and because I've been thinking a lot about that, having read uh, René Girard and ah, uh, um, the, the one I saw Satan fall as lightning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, maybe that's 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 a whole other big topic that it's probably yeah. we can't get into yeah. right now. But um, I, well, anyway, what you said. Uh, Chris struck me as quite profound. But notice what we've done, because we've enacted it. We, we start with this notion of soul, and notice how we've, we've done all the processions. We have projected it out, right, into all of these variations, almost like the projection of sound in music, mm-hmm. right? But we're also periodically, we, we keep circling back and gathering back, and we're trying to find what is the thread running, yeah. what is, this, what is the, the synthematic thread that runs through all these projections, and thereby I can retrace back to their origin, originating source, right? Because we haven't disclosed it fully. Of course we haven't. But, you know, we've enacted the very process I'm talking about. We cycle out, we project out, we gather back in, and we're constantly doing this. And we've just done it all over soul. Now, have we come up have we come yeah. with a definition of it? I don't think we have a definition no. of it. No. But are we now in a are we now in a more right relationship with the reality that is referred to by soul? I think so. I think I so think too. So. Yeah. Yeah. There so I go. think I think that just the notion becomes more evocative. It doesn't take any final form or or, or structure or or certainly not any kind of certainty uh, attached to it. Yeah. No. It's like it's like we we come within range of knowing by the light of that which we cannot define. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think it, th- these things are always epic static for us. We're always, right, we're always, uh, we're, we, 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 we get a trajective sense of them in our constant trajectory towards them. That's, right. and that's wonderful. But notice what you have to give up. You have to give up the having mode. The having mode is about completable goals. Right, yeah. I, I I can drink until I am done. Yeah, but becoming wise, like right, I I I, I there's no doneness, there's no fi- there's no it's final, I'm complete. In fact, that's that's a sure sign that somebody isn't wise, right? Yeah. And having something to say has to be given up as well, in a sense. Yes, hmm. I notice sort of a silence overtaking me, and then the compulsion to speak. The two, the two move right. Um, I mean. Right now, I, I t- I'm tending to speak a lot because I'm 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 very much caught up in trying to voice what is what I'm trying to follow. I'm, I, there's a vocation for me. I'm being called, right, and I'm trying to give voice to this calling, um, this sense of being called, um, and I feel a particular urgency of how it's impregnating me and impressing upon me, but also the urgency of the need of the situation we're in, both the meaning crisis and the particular the way it's being accelerated by the COVID crisis. Um, but I appreciate what you're saying, Andrew. Um, um, mm. I, I think... I, I, I didn't mean that as a criticism or to suggest that you oh, were, no. were speaking too, mu- too much. I'm just saying it's almost like there's a compulsion to speak and you have, you have to stop yourself and say... What, what, why am I speaking? What is the, you know, am I adding yeah. anything to this conversation or am I, I, I just I, yeah. like speaking? Yeah, but yeah. I feel that you're being animated by something beyond that. So, so I, I never questioned that in, in, in what you were saying. Yeah, I, I, I just want to reassure, I guess I was trying to offer reassurance that um, I am trying to cultivate a sense where I am receptive to being struck by people, by insight, connection, criticism and commentary that they give such that I will take it to heart if I have good plausible reason to believe it was given in good faith. That's a standard. I'm tr- that's a virtue I'm trying to cultivate. Hmm. Yeah. And multiple times in this conversation, you've seen me, I, I'm struck by what either one of you have said something and it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And well, and also, also Chris has been much quieter in this conversation and um part of me is like wanting you to speak more because because you have such a way with words on the other on the other hand i, I think there's a dignity at other times in, in just um you know uh 
being present in the conversation and that adds something to the conversation as much as words would add to the conversation. I think so. Yeah. Because I, I mean, well, I was just going to say Chris listens better than anybody that I know. He really does. Well, thank you. No, John. come on. Chris. Um, I mean, that's not just meant but, as, as, a, as a compliment of a friendship. You listen in this deeply res- responsive and receptive way. Right. And, 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 and you, you take it to heart, like I've been saying, and mm-hmm. you come. So when you come back um, after the silence, I mean, that's why it was. That's why you spoke of this, right? because you come back out of the silence, right? Um, yeah, in, yeah. In in in, in 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 like, and you speak in virtue of it, and you speak in right, of yeah, it. or 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 try to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. No, I I thank you for thank you for saying it that way. I think um, because because to me identifying with the rhythm of the dialogos doesn't always mean being its voice, mm. right? Because, because the listening ear is the, uh, to, to me, like the dialogos, the dialogos takes the, the, the various dialogists and collapses them into an entity so that yeah. the listening voice and the, 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 sorry, the speaking voice and the listening ear collapse into unity. And so the unity of the list, the, the listening ear and the speaking voice is such that partaking of the rhythm of the conversation can simply be that, can simply be being its form of silence, being its form of listening silence. And, um, and you're right. I, I, and, I, and I have this, I, I share your feeling, Andrew, of wanting to make sure that, that any time this, this speech is offered, that it is offered in that it's that it's tuned to the rhythm of the dialogue mm. so that oh. it contributes to the evolution of the melody and it doesn't interrupt it or if it does interrupt it in, it interrupts it in order to pivot it meaningfully yeah. and not gratuitously so I, I like that's that's so important to me the economy of dialogos is really really important to me Beautiful. and and and, mm-hmm. and because i think it's something that has to be finessed and it's something you can you can get better at and you can get more more fluent in so i yeah, think yeah i think, yeah, I think so. just, reticence is not reticence is not um reticence is not fear or, or trepidation most of the time it's just it's it's just wait it's waiting for the chirotic opportunity where the voice becomes an essential part of the dialogic evolution um, and, and, and therein big dignifies itself, you know? So, so you, you I, I got this powerful image out of this and I don't know if you were attending it. Uh, you know, this notion of the way the Greek chorus bears witness, uh, cause in dialectic, all the people that are not speaking are basically the Greek chorus bearing witness in a reflective fashion and always poised to, you know, disturb uh, what the speaker has done or, or, or uh, like they're, they're, they're meant to call the speaker out in both meanings of that word. They're meant and they're to- right here now and uh, they're here and uh, they're with us in a sense. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I'm playing on this notion of calling out when you call somebody out and you, that means you're trying to draw them, but you're also calling them into giving an account, right. Of themselves and being responsible. Like I'm calling you out. Right. Um, and, and so, the, I mean, that, that's how I understand the function of the Greek chorus. And what I was hearing when Chris was, I just got this image when he was talking about, uh, you know, all the people participating, for example, in a dialectic, that the, 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 what's happening is, you know, momentarily this person is the speaker, right, in, in the Greek, and then you, all the other people are the, the Greek chorus bearing witness. And, and people often, and, and it's telling that we don't understand the dramatic function of the Greek chorus any, anymore. Uh, so, Chris, was, was I correct in picking up on that illusion? Ah, yeah, yeah, no, I think so. I think so. Because I, I think what the chorus does, I mean, there's a reason that the, that the traditional function of the Greek chorus is in part a, a, um, a wordless, ex- well, they're not always wordless, sometimes they speak, but when they don't speak, they are a wordless expression of the dramatic irony that knows the circumstances of the plot beyond its own knowing. Yeah. So, right, you listen for, like the, the, the Greek chorus hears everything that is not said as opposed to everything that is said. And cool. so they represent, again, they represent the form of proleptic knowing that sees the meta meaning of the narrative beyond the, beyond 
the meaning that the characters are living right, out. Right, right. Mm. So, the, the, so, so the representation of that presence in a dialogue, I think, is very important because it hears and sees everything that is that is yet unsaid, that is yet unspoken, that has not yet been shown forth. And so the presence, the presence of that person shows forth the dialogos to patterns that it has not yet espoused, just as the Greek chorus, with their eye to dramatic irony, can see the meta-meaningfulness of the narrative that is not available to the characters that are being born out through it. That's amazing. Mm, yeah. That's really um, and it gives me a, a slight insight into why, why we're doing this as well, because we're not just doing this for ourselves or for some egocentric reason, even though it might appear that like putting our, putting videos on YouTube, because there is the, there is this chorus around us. There is this yeah, multiplicity good. of voices that we are responsible to, or that, that are, that are, I don't know if I've articulated that. No, I think that's exactly right. That's the, weird, that's the weird symbol on of this medium, Andrew. Like, I mean, think about, well, think about Socrates. He didn't want to write anything down because he thought the permanence of text would, right, choke off the life of, lo of Logos, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Plato, of course, then ironically, especially in a dramatically ironic sense, uh, went ahead to write all these dramas. Um, but what we are doing is we are doing the, the, the we're, you know, we are ensouling speech here yeah. in Dialogos. And it has that, you know, if effervescent but ephemeral quality of conversation, but it's also being made permanent by recording. We are yeah. joining together. It's also a performance of some kind. Uh, it yes. absolutely is. Like, it's not just we're talking to each other. Uh, no, I mean, no. it kind of seems that way. And it's going it, to be taken up and have a life of itself beyond us. Normally, yeah. when conversation ended, the only life it had was in the memory of the participants. Wow. Now, like text it will have a life of its own independent of our authorship. And yeah. that means we are bridging between the two things that Plato saw as oppositional. We are yeah. getting the permanency of text, but we're getting the living breath mm. of dialogue. And we're getting yes. theater because we need theater. I mean, well, uh, this is what's missing in our culture is real theater. And, and I think that is what almost what's compelling us to talk like this and, and, I, and it's appropriate that, that Chris, Christoph would use these theatrical metaphors because, um, you know, all of the life is a, a stage. Um, yeah. yeah. All the world's a stage. It, it also, I think, fits the dialogic process with its share of danger. We were talking before about the fact that, you know, in order to be changed by something, it ha you, have to, you have to risk dispossession and you have to risk, there has to be something deleterious about it. And I think that that's the public nature of it actually fits it with that quality because mm -hmm. there is, or I don't know if you guys feel it, I still feel it every time I do one of these things. I feel a sense, a very pregnant sense sense of risk i feel a very pregnant oh, sense yeah. of danger oh, oh. and mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. to me that's essential that's essential i think civilis said something very very eloquent about this too in terms of of let that the public nature is what actually allows for the uh, is what is what um the 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 public nature of these dialogues is precisely what opens them to the possibility of dynamic quality because you have to, you, you're, you're walking on the knife edge. Yeah. And, um, and so the, the, and, and I think there's some kind of, there's some kind of artful balance or equilibration that some dialogues strike better than others, depending on the amount of awareness that the dialogue accommodates of the witnessing presence of the chorus that sees it from without. Yeah. And, and, and every dialogue is a little different. How each dialogue accommodates that presence is a little bit different. Some seem to kind of carry on almost heedless of it. Some are so hyper aware of it that they become yeah. so fraught with their, their mm -hmm. foreknowing sense of risk that they become almost inhibited by it. But there's some, something down the middle of uh -huh. those two. And when that catches properly, I think that the, the, the fear of exposure um, risked by the perspective that sees this from without 
is, is part of what helps to ensoul it with its possibility. Mm -hmm. Because perhaps if you make yourself vulnerable as well, and if it, it, with through your sincerity, you also become the potential object for ridicule, ridicule or the potential scapegoat. Um, totally, totally. But that's yeah. the virtue again. Yeah. The virtue, uh, virtue is what steers you between the, you know, the vices of deficiency and the vices of, uh, you know, uh, excess. Right, yeah. and 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 I'm thinking here that part of what the chorus does. I mean, the chorus. So the 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 hero is on center stage. The way the hero archetype is on center stage right now in a lot of these discourse. And I keep trying to remind people that the heroic myth always needs to be counterbalanced with the hubris myths. And I think that the chorus often speaks the voice of the warning of hubris to counterbalance. That's definitely what's happening in the tragedies to counterbalance, right? The heroism of the hero. And, and, and you're supposed to you, right? The, the hero, especially in the tragedy ultimately is defeated, but right. And this is sort of more of a Nietzschean interpretation than Aristotelian. But the point is that the, the, the person who's partaking in, right, the drama, watching the drama, right, actually gets steered between, right, hubris and uh, an overblown heroism, mm -hmm. and, right? So they don't, they're not a coward uh, because they admire the beauty of the hero, but they remember the mortality because the chorus speaks of hubris and we witness its, what we, we witness its effects. So I think there's something important about um, the way we have this invisible chorus around us right now, because it really helps uh, us cultivate a virtue in which, like a kind of courage, where we're not hyper vigilant and therefore terrorized into timidity, or we are just overblown and just speaking um, in some reckless and heedless fashion. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the word that came to me is is um, the chorus keeps you uh, humble, uh, humility, uh, um, but also also not not. Um, mm. Well, it encourages you. But there's some part, if you're part of a chorus, you're part of a, a grand story at the same time. So there's this humility and there's this, this, this uh, you know, this, um, I don't know, dramatic, grandiose. But you're right, yes, yes. Ex excitement yes. about life or... or mm -hmm. What it does, I think, is actually, it's a higher oh, order of relevance. It, t it, it represents a higher order of relevance that then is... That then is 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 gifted to the dialogue. Very much, very much. I was going to say that in addition to the humiliation of the hero, the chorus also honors the hero, right? Um, the, it, 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 it's right. The chorus will often, um, you know, uh, bespeak um, the, 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 some of the virtues of the hero. So the the right. I just want to say this because I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to make portray the chorus as just something that's humiliating the hero. The chorus also honors the hero. the The chorus reminds us. The chorus will often remind us of elements of the hero's path that have rendered him heroic mm. in important ways. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to nuance that a bit, Andrew. The, the The chorus is doing that. You know that presentation of hubris, uh, but it's also bound up with a recognition, uh, an honoring of the hero. Uh, it's, it's, so I'm trying to make it, what I'm trying to say, here, here, this is what I want to say. The relationship between the hero and the chorus is not adversarial. It's opponent processing. It's mm -hmm. opponent processing. It's a process that's it's supposed to be a self-correcting process. Right? I, I wonder if it's something like the relationship between the individual instrumentalist and the conductor of the orchestra, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean, a, a really good book on all of this, um, the, how important this is, is uh, this book, uh, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, Persons, Things, and the Nature of Erotic Life. And he doesn't mean sexual eroticism. Uh, this is John Rusin's uh, book. I, he's also works in Canada, at least he did when he wrote this book. And this whole notion of bearing witness to epiphany, right, which is bringing together so much of what we've said, and how it's so central a process, bearing witness in this right way, is one of the deep ways in which we enculturate people and in, in which we, 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 we turn them into persons. So maybe the the chorus is a person um, generating function. I, I think Chris is right. It's the it's an overarching 
a higher order relevance realization um, uh -huh. that is yeah contributing to um, the cultivation of personhood. Yeah, yeah, very much. And it reminds and us what, ever, what it reminds us what what is essential, what matters, what what is alive, and what is what is you know, what is hubris, and what is what is false, um, what is good faith, and what is bad yes. faith. And, yep. mm -hmm. Precisely, precisely because it because it creates because it creates the bridge of continuity between the frame and it's, it's a transframing device, right? Oh, right. It's, it Beautiful. is, it is the continuity between what is enclosed within the frame in, in, in this case, the narrative within this metaphor yeah. and what is beyond the frame yeah. of the narrative. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and you're precisely right that the, 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 the most, the, the most apt description of that continuity is precisely the relation of faith. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's good. And then you get, oh, and then I think what that does uh, to invoke uh, bo both of your, uh, your sort of uh, uh, familiarity with Catholicism, that's what tradition was supposed to be. Tradition was your faithfulness to the chorus that precedes and is beyond you and pronounces upon you continuously. Mm. Yeah. Like Precisely. the host or something of hmm. Precisely. Well, Precisely. You, I mean, in the liturgy, you always invoke the host. The host, yeah. Of all the people, not only all the people th that are present visibly, you invoke all the invisible people that are present, all the salients, all, I say all the saints are made salient. All the angels and saints. All the yeah. angels and saints. Right? Yeah. The yeah, heavenly host. Absolutely. So you, 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 host. And also, you, so you come back to being in a cosmos uh, again. Uh, um, not, not yeah, being, you get to a face wandering, it. a wandering, fragmented, you know, um, yeah. person, and then you 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 find yourself situated in in a, in a mandala or a cosmos or in a world again. To use Heidegger's, yeah, I think so. I um, think so. Yes. I mean, I I've always been struck. Uh, but Spinoza has this notion of, you know, we can find what he calls the face of the universe. Uh, uh, which is this sort of gestalting thing that allows us to enter into right relationship with it, right? And, and, and so, yeah, I think it's doing exactly that. We're back to the interfacing notion again. Yeah. Right? Tradition is a powerful way in which we interface um, with, with the universe and, and, ma and make it, as you said, make it cosmic for us as opposed mm -hmm. to just a, 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 an empty set of stuff thrown together. Not an empty set. I want to say a purely logic. I didn't mean an empty set. I mean a purely logical, a purely, purely formal set, as opposed to a logos. The difference between a, a Death set, Star, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The difference between a, a, a you know a set is you you put any any things into it, and they're okay. just bound together by the formal grouping. But the logos is they things are grouped together so that they come to belong together, and then mm -hmm. and thereby and thereby their belonging to each other is how they can include you and you can participate. Their belonging to each other is precisely how you can belong to them. Hmm. I should get going guys. <laughs> back to, back to the, 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 uh, the world as it is, the world as it is exactly. The, hmm. Do you have anything else to say, Christopher, before we end this? No? Nope. I'll let that be the final word. Okay. Well, th thank you so much. Uh, that was amazing. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Again, Andrew. for convening us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great. So we talked about the soul this time. That was, a, that was the word I threw in in the beginning. And, and maybe if we do it again sometime, <laughs> I wonder what ne what's next. I, I like this, Andrew. Actually, I like this idea of oh. picking a pregnant topic and then throwing it in, and we do that thing I talked about. Yeah. We open it up, and then we recollect it, and open it up and recollect it, yeah. as opposed to just right forming the circle, uh, but okay. actually centering the circle upon a chosen topic a chosen and topic, philosophy sure. on it. I, I, I think this is an excellent thing we did. What I really like, actually, is this th this uh, three three people. Um, I find it's it's much more interesting for me uh, in these kind of conversations if there's three people here. It's, it seems to be a, a, such a, a much more dynamic energy than just one person against another person. Um, yeah. Or or uh, so so that's one thing I, I really love is this trio 
I'm, I'm doing that with other people as well. Well, you have the intimate chorus then. Because when the yeah, because people... the, yeah, the chorus is present when when we're three for some reason. Yep, exactly. We're, we're we're more like we're on a stage. There's more than just two people. That yeah, again, and we're we're actually on a real stage when there's three. The chorus is here. Because <laughs> the because because the symbol of the third factor can emerge more yeah. apparently well, when there's right, three. Right, the third factor. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a way of uh, you know creating a, a locus for the third factor third yeah. factor to emerge very much yeah right and if there's a fourth person somehow one person is kind of left out a little bit uh, of the conversation or not always but and if it's five it's just too many <laughs> so three <laughs> seems beautiful what anyway i'll let you go thank thank you so much guys that was just uh mind-blowing as as always and even more so this time <laughs> yeah well thank you i do and again thank you chris it's always wonderful to be in your presence thanks guys likewise bye-bye